we started this uh, time praying together because prayer is an acknowledgement. It's a very act of praying. It's, a, it's an acknowledgement that we don't have what it takes on our own. You see, Just the very, the very act of turning to God is an admission that I, I must not have this thing all figured out on my own. And, and the, the presence and the power that we've experienced together over the last few days, it will bring healing and new life to the church in ways that no program or strategy you could come up with could ever do. You see, there's no, there's no tricks here. It's not something you can just manufacture. We don't even, we don't build the church, you see. It's not our church to build, you see. Our job is to get out of the way. Um, okay, I probably I probably should uh, end this time on a, just a fun. We should probably you know just a fun like celebratory note. But I I can't. I have to I have to share what the Spirit is speaking to me. Okay, and so I just need to. I got I have some things I just want us to say to send us out of this time. And I feel like, uh, <laughs> part of me feels like, what kind of moron plans a schedule and, and puts himself after all these incredible speakers? <laughs> like, I am such an idiot. And, <laughs> and yet, I just, I have something that I want to share with you today. It's something I've never preached on, on, on this in quite this way. And, um, and yet, I feel like it's a, a word for the church today. And specifically, I want to apologize ahead of time to my, there's a number of people here who are not a part of the United Methodist Church, but I feel like it's, uh, it's just a burden that I have for the Methodist tribe. And so some of what I, w- I want to share with you um, over these few minutes that we have before we, we leave here are um, a call specifically to my Methodist friends and family. You know, in some ways, uh, I think about, you know, when Paul kind of gives his, uh, he gives his kind of Jewish credentials, you know, like if there was ever a good Jew, I'm a good Jew, you know, like I've got all the credentials to back it up. In some ways, you know, I feel, I feel like, you know, I feel like that a little bit in the Methodist church, you know, I was confirmed in the eighth grade, you know, Methodist of the people of Grace UMC since birth. When it, when it comes to zeal, leading youth group when I was in sixth grade, preaching when I was in high school, you know. When it comes to potlucks, relentless. <laughs> <laughs> and yet now I consider it all loss. But for the sake of knowing Christ. My whole life, from the moment I was born, has been nurtured by this church. When I was in high school, I I first started feeling God calling me into ministry when I was in sixth grade. It was in ninth grade at a church camp when I committed my life to that trajectory. I didn't 
exactly know what it meant. I don't think I really knew where that would take me, but I, I knew what God was asking of me, and it was, it was so real that I had to have the release of just saying yes. You know, it was such a weight that I felt like if I don't just surrender to this thing, like it's, gonna, it's just going to bury me. And so I said, okay, Lord, whatever you want. You, this is a dangerous prayer. It's a prayer as a ninth grade boy that has haunted my life ever since. But I just, I didn't know what else to say. I went forward. The, the talk that night wasn't about anything about going into ministry. And I just prayed this prayer. Lord, I don't know what it looks like, but whatever you want, I'll spend the rest of my life trying to do it. I'll, try, I'll just try to be obedient to whatever you want. In God's crazy way, somehow that eventually led to this, you know. And my heart, my heart breaks to see the church that has shaped my whole life return to her first love like we sang just a little while ago. There's a verse that has been haunting me lately, um, and I feel like it's a verse for, for our church. It's... It's in Galatians, and um, it's a verse that that just that haunts my haunts my mind when I, when I think of our church. It's Galatians three three, you know it. Uh, Paul is you know addressing the Galatians, speaking to a group of people who are distorting the gospel, trying to enslave people under the yoke of the law, and, and rather than than freedom in Christ and the way that the, the the gift of grace leads us into transformation, they're trying to put onto people these unending rules and regulations, returning to sort of the Jewish ways. And he says this in Galatians 3.3, after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Listen to me. That's a question for our church today. Whatever happened, to those radicals who preached Christ in the fields, to those crazy Christ followers who had to deal with accusations of enthusiasm because of their passion and the way that God showed up in their midst. Whatever happened to the days of the circuit rider where there was you know, this proverbial saying that when it was bad weather, nobody's out today but the crows and, and the Methodist preachers. I love that. Why? Because they were driven with this this fervor for the mission of seeing people come to Christ and grow in holiness. A movement that began with prayer and fasting became an institution of legislation and strategic planning. A movement that began with accountable relational discipleship became an institution with endless self-help books and Sunday schools. A movement that, that mobilized people to reach the lost and to come alongside the poor became an institution better suited for the fossilized than the rich. Now, just don't get me uh, wrong. Uh, I'm not without great hope in all of this. Even this weekend has renewed my hope again. I've seen God. I've seen, I've, as I've started to get around into little, little pockets of the country, I've seen God. He's bubbling up a new movement of radical Christianity around this country. I've seen it within our own Wesleyan world. And it's, it's not coming by the many or, or by the ones with organizational titles. It's coming by the few. It's coming by the meek. It's coming by the desperate. By those who are willing to admit that they're out of answers. See, the, the delusion of the church in our day, I think, is, is this idea that we can scheme or plan our way to grow. You and I cannot manufacture revival. Spirit and truth is not a ministry designed to manufacture revival. Do you hear me? Because we cannot do that. Revival is not our job. 
That's God's job. But we do have to get out of the way. I've, uh, I, was, I was praying this week, and um, I was fascinated. I don't know why, but this, this symbol just fascinates me. And I don't know an awful lot about it, um, so I started looking up some things this week. This is actually, my grandpa made this for me, uh, who's a member of this church, actually. And so I started looking up some, uh, some things this week because I'm just fascinated by how we arrived at this. Uh, this, really, this came out of the merger in 1968 between the EUB church and uh, the Methodist church. And at the Uniting Conference in 1968, um, it, there was this you know, commission, basically, uh, that they needed to come up with a new insignia to represent the new church that would be kind of their stamp for this new merged church. And so uh, it would be designed and created by what would become, it was called the Division of Interpretation of the Program Council, okay? It's a, it's a really catchy name. It just rolls off your tongue, right? <laughs> yeah. If there's one thing that Methodists are good at, it's not coming up with names <laughs> for committees. Oh, God. Uh, you need four slides to put the name of some of our committees up on the screen, right? Uh, any case, here's something I never knew. Will you catch this? This, is, this just blew me away when I realized this. Did you know that after the, 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 the Uniting Conference there in 1968, uh, there had been some work already on coming up with different concepts for this design, okay? But it wasn't actually uh, decided for sure which design was going to be used until October of 1968. And the program council with this, uh, whatever that name I just said, that was supposed to, to, to solidify this, this logo, it was, um, the program council was, was convened 50 years ago. Do you know where? In Dayton, Ohio. 50 years ago, in this city, there was a committee that together decided this is going to be what signifies, you know, visually who we are. Now, I want you to hear a little bit of why, um, at least the, some of the, the language, I was reading a little bit of a memoir from one of the persons on that committee. I want you to hear some of the language, why they decided to use this logo, okay? Just, I want you to catch this. The cross was described as representing Christ's sacrifice and also get, uh, the giving of self for others, which in turn suggests a service uh, you know, service to others, which is a dominant kind of factor in Wesleyan tradition. But listen to this. The flame, this kind of came known, the catchphrase, the cross and the flame. The flame was identified as a, a traditional symbol of the Holy Spirit. And they said it was appropriately included because, listen, this is what they said, a substantial part of the Wesleyan contribution in theological understanding involves the work of the Holy Spirit. The description from the commission continues like this. The flame is also symbolic of Pentecost with its implication for the evangelization of men. In fact, they described each of these pieces. These, they said these are two tongues of fire. <laughs> two tongues of fire representing Pentecost, which sends us out to evangelize the world. Two streams, the EUB church and the Methodist church, two tongues of fire representing the fire of the Holy Spirit sent out to evangelize the world. That's the insignia that you find on thousands and thousands of structures and millions of pieces of paper all over the globe. Here's the problem. We've got a flame in our brand, but we've got no more flame in our bones. We've got a fire in our logo, but we've got no fire in our lungs.
And I'm praying, oh God, oh God, would you set your people ablaze again? It was right here in Dayton, Ohio, 50 years ago that a group of people decided that a flame would be the centerpiece of our denomination's brand. And I'm starting to believe that maybe, maybe, just maybe, 50 years later, right here in Dayton, Ohio, God is raising up a core of people who will put the flame back into our bones. I, want, I wanted to, to close our time just by giving you uh, two reflections, uh, two, two ideas about how the fi- what happens when the fire of God comes, okay? Two things that happen when, when the fire of God comes, you know, w- what will happen? And, and I want to give you just two. There's so m- the, the, the imagery of fire, the metaphor in the scriptures of, of fire is just incredible. It's pervasive in the scriptures. All over the place you see the way God shows up in fire. But I want to give you just, just two ways uh, that, that I think this idea of holy fire informs what we should look for moving forward, okay? Remember, it was John the Baptist who said in Matthew 3.11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am unworthy to carry, and he will baptize you with what? With the Holy Spirit and with fire. Here's the two things, okay? There's so much that we could get into. Here's the two things. Two things that that holy fire does. One, holy fire spreads. Number two, holy fire purifies. Holy fire spreads. Holy fire purifies. Look at uh, John 15, verse 26. These are Jesus' own words about what the Holy Spirit will do when he comes. Okay, John 15. When the advocate comes, the Holy Spirit... Whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father. Listen to what he says. He will testify about me. This is Jesus talking. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So this is super basic, right? Christianity 101. One of the the roles of the Holy Spirit, the way that the Spirit works, the Spirit always testifies about Jesus. So here's... Here's the bottom line, okay? People it, who are yielded more and more to the Holy Spirit, guess what we will do? We will testify more and more about Jesus. See, look, we've had such an incredible time, and we've had all kinds of incredible experiences with God. And I'm all for the, the spiritual gifts. I believe in all of them. I believe in, in, in expecting God for the supernatural. But let me just get one thing very clear If you are truly yielding to the Holy Spirit, do you know one thing I guarantee will happen? If you are yielding more to the Spirit, you will talk about Jesus more. You will tell more people about Jesus. Why? Because the Spirit that lives in us is the one who testifies about Jesus. The Holy Spirit, the the flame of God, He is not just a nice spiritual toy that we chase after for some kind of warm and fuzzy experience. The Spirit is the sending one. When the Spirit comes, God's people go. Just think think back to Pentecost, right? I mean, we we have these tongues of fire in our logo. Think back to Pentecost. What, What happens? The Spirit comes. What's the first thing that happens? They spill out into the streets. These are people who are huddled together, who are, you know, waiting. The the one that they follow, who, who they've seen do incredible things, both before and after his resurrection, is gone. And they're waiting. Now what do we do? And what happens? What takes a man like Peter... Who, who is scared to acknowledge his, his relationship with Jesus not long before and turns him into the great evangelist who preaches the first you know, church sermon uh, of history. It's the Spirit. When the Spirit comes, God's people go. The Spirit is a sending God. Holy fire always spreads. 
Think, think about just the metaphor for a second. I think this is kind of fun. Fire that doesn't, does, doesn't spread, it's, it's really not much of a fire, is it? Uh, what, I think there's kind of like, there's one of two things that's happening. If a fire doesn't, doesn't sort of catch anything else on fire, what's happening? Probably two things. One, either the fire is kind of smoldering and it's on its way out. Or two, it's never coming into contact with anything that can be caught on fire. It's insulated from that which could catch. Do you get me? Do you see where I'm going with this? So I think we've got one of two problems. If fire is not spreading in your churches, if it's not spreading in our denomination, we've got one of two problems. Either we're, we're not on fire ourselves, we're just maybe smoldering at best and we're on our way out, there's not enough heat there to catch anything else on fire. Or if there is a fire, we're so, we're so cozied up in the fireplace, <laughs> you know, just content to sort of stay contained in our little bubble, and we never actually come into contact with anything that's flammable. Do you understand that all around this building, just outside these doors, there are, there are thousands of flammable things? They're called people who are desperate to be set on fire with the love of God. And part of the reason that we don't see the, the fire spread, I think, is because we keep it so contained. Pentecost comes, they hit the streets. Holy fire comes, we must go. Can I share a story with you? You like stories? Uh, so part of, uh, a, a big part of what we do in our ministry, when we come into a local church, it, I shared this a little bit last night, very briefly, but we just mobilize everyday folks to say, let's get serious about trusting that God can lead us, and we're going to go out into the community, and we're just going to offer to pray with folks, okay? And we'll just see what God does, and we're going to give you some tools so that uh, if God opens the door, you'll be prepared to share about Jesus, okay? This is it's not rocket science. It, we are not a flashy bunch. This is as basic as it gets. I want to share, this is a story, one of my favorite stories I've seen over the last two years. Once, I, I loved, I loved my ministry uh, in Salina. Our, our church was just, we have some, some of my favorite people in all the world are here this morning from that church. It was so incredible, and I loved that season there. But something changed in me when I got outside of the church, and I started spending more time on the streets. And I want to share with you one of my favorite stories. I've seen just... <laughs> Hundreds of encounters of just people, God just showing up and just speaking life into people or people coming to Christ and then being, you know, connected with someone who can walk with them in discipleship. All kinds of crazy stuff, okay? Here's, my, here's one of my very favorites. I was, I was just, I was, I'd already announced to my church that I was leaving. Some people thought I was nuts. My church was incredibly supportive. They could see what God was doing. They sent me out as a missionary. But I, I know some of the people in the denomination, others, thought, you know, you're nuts, like, you've got a great appointment, <laughs> you've got one of those nice appointments, you know, with a bigger church and a nice parsonage, like, I didn't get in it for that, okay, and uh, I, I was just getting ready to leave the church, and I go to a, a, a Revive uh, outreach down in Texas, uh, down in Dallas-Fort Worth area, okay, one day, I'm with my little team, and we're headed out, and uh, we did just what I described, we just prayed, and we're in the car, and we're praying. We don't have a set place that we're going to go. God, by your spirit, would you just lead us where you want us to go? We believe there's people here all over this, this city who need you. Just show us who they are and who we should talk to. That's it. It's not complicated. Okay, we just believe that God can still lead us that way. So we pray in the car. Now, here's where you're going to, you know, you start to think I'm a little bit crazy. But by now, with all that you've experienced, you already realize I'm a little bit crazy. So you're okay with it. We pray, and in the car, all right, this is all, this is new stuff to me, okay? Never had a lot of these experiences before. I'm praying in the car, and all of a sudden, in my mind, we're praying for discernment. I get a picture of a person in, in a purple shirt, okay? I do not say this out loud to my group because I think, man, they're going to think I'm really weird. Like, whatever, I'm just, you know, I probably ate something weird for breakfast. I don't know, you know? But I, I saw it. There was a person in a purple shirt. When we were praying, there was a picture there, and I couldn't deny it, okay? But I'm too afraid to say it to anybody. So one person in our group says, we ought to go to a park. 
And so we start driving, and uh, they, they had felt like we were supposed to go to a park. So we pull up at this park. It's super busy. It's a holiday weekend, actually. And so um, I think it was maybe Memorial Day weekend. And there's tons of people at the park just hanging out, families and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so we get out, and, and look, our ministry, we don't just tackle people. We don't go beat them over the head with the Bible. We try to, we say, these are our four steps. Love, listen, discern, respond. That's it. If we love well, we listen well, we'll be able to discern what the Spirit's saying, and then we can respond to that. Okay? That's it. Not complicated. So we're walking through the park, and uh, in the back of my mind, I thought, oh, man, I hope I don't see a person with a purple shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, and uh, so we're like kind of just like we split up in pairs and we're walking around like just praying like, you know, God, who would you have us talk with? Lo and behold, I'm walking across the, uh, the middle of the park there and out of the back room at just that time steps this young guy in a bright purple shirt and I thought, oh no, <laughs> oh no, now I have to talk to him. I grabbed my uh, my my partner and we went over, and I, I, all this, I said, uh, hey, this, this may be a little bit odd, I don't know, but we're just out praying for folks, and I wondered how he could pray for you. He said, uh, well, yeah, you can pray for me, but I want you to meet, I'm here with my grandma, would you come and meet, meet her? So he takes us over to a tree, there's a, a woman uh, sitting under the tree, her name is Diana. We get to introduce, uh, you know, ourselves to Diana, and we begin to have this conversation, and she is blown away that they're just some random people, one of them from Ohio, in, in Dallas, Texas, who just want to pray for her. We start to talk to her, and, and, and we say, Diana, you know, how can we pray for you? She asked for prayers for her grandson, the one that had taken us there, the purple shirt, right? She asked us for prayers for her family, and uh, we had this nice prayer time. They, they both, I think they both were, were believers. They were both uh, Christians in some respect, but, uh, but they, they weren't plugged into a church right now. She she, uh, she had her uh, son, Colin, there, who's across the way. She called Colin. She said, hey, you've got to meet Colin. He's a good guy. I think you'll like him. And she called him over. We had a nice conversation, and uh, it was great, and we, and we prayed for them. And then, um, I don't know, we walked away. And as we're walking away, I thought, well, that was nice. Uh, we prayed for them. We encouraged them. That was fun. That's just, that's odd. Like, why did I see this picture of a purple shirt and now we're just kind of walking away? The person that I was with said, um, Matt, I don't think we were done there. And I said, okay. She said, we, I feel like we're supposed to ask them about baptism. And I was, okay. Uh, I guess we'll go back. <laughs> And so we turned around and we go back to the group under the tree and uh, we said, hey, uh, this is kind of odd. I know we just walked away, but we feel like we're supposed to ask you if you've ever been baptized before. And Diana says, no, but I've been wanting to be baptized so badly. She said, I just, I, just, I just got to know about Jesus through my son, Colin, just, just the last couple of years. I don't go to a church regularly. I'm not even sure that I know of a church that would really be okay with me coming. But she said, I do believe and I do want to be baptized. Now look, just to qualify things here as this <laughs> goes on. Uh, I'm not working with a Methodist <laughs> The uh, uh, ministry at this point. So they're doing things a little differently than maybe that would be my tendency, okay? So just let me qualify that. But you know what? God still works in it, okay? So relax when I tell you this next part, okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I said, you know, well, this is kind of weird, but we have a truck, <laughs> That has a baptismal in the back of it. <laughs> what, what, what do you think if we, we baptize you this afternoon here at the park? <laughs> she said, are you serious? And I said, uh, yeah, it's something that this ministry offers. And she said, 
you don't know how much that would mean to me. You would come here to me? You would come here? I said, yeah. Diana, God loves you. you. Obviously, your faith is in him. And you want to be baptized, and we can connect you with the local church. But if you want to be baptized, let's just like, you know, Philip and the eunuch, let's do it today, you know? Why not? And so here's, here's what happens. We pull, we, later that afternoon, we arrange the, the truck. I'm like, I'm thinking, is she even, is she going to be here still? This I don't know if it's going to work. We pull up later. Sure enough, she's gathered up uh, her little family that was there. We pull up a, a truck to the park. And <laughs> we have a baptismal service right there in the middle of the park. Now, um, now you have to understand uh, that looks odd to some people, <laughs> okay? But I'm getting to a place in my life where I just don't care. And so, because here's what happened, you understand? Uh, all of a sudden, a crowd of people start gathering around. They're like, what the heck are these freaks doing, you know? What is going on here? Do you you want to see what happens here? Fire spreads. Fire spreads. We, we, we have a baptismal service uh, uh, with Diana. All of these just random people come over to see what's going on. They get to participate in this act of the church together. Okay? I know this is outside of your liturgical box. I'm sorry. Okay? We, we don't have a baptism truck with spirit and truth. Okay? Uh, do you... Yet. <laughs> do you know there were, there were four young ladies, uh, some of our team members... Uh, with the ministry, started just talking with folks that had gathered. Do you know four young teenage girls gave their lives to Christ because they walked up to watch this baptism? And then listen, okay, Colin, this is what I didn't tell you. Colin has an incredible testimony. This is Diana's son. He gets to be a part of her baptism. Colin is fired up at this point. You see, Colin had, had been involved in a life of crime. He had spent a, a good chunk of his life in and out of jail. And yet he had this testimony. He said, I've been crime free for eight years, and it's just because of Jesus. And so at the back of the baptismal truck, after her baptism, he says to me, Matt, I need to be doing what you're doing. I, how can I do this to you? I, I, need to, I need to go with you guys. I need to tell people what Jesus has done for me. And I said, okay, Colin, why don't you just come with us? What are you doing tomorrow? You know? And he says, I work all day, but I, do you ever do this in the evening? The next evening was the only night that we were doing an evening outreach the whole week. He said, I get off at 7. Can, can we meet? I said, yeah. You, you call me. Tell me where to pick you up. I'll pick you up. I'll save you a spot on my team. We go out in teams of four. I go, lo and behold, that day, Colin, Colin sends me a text. Guess who's on my outreach team the next night? Colin, who I met at the park the day before. You see, you don't, you don't need a seminary training for this. When you have the fire of God, it will spread if you are willing to go, you see. And so Colin joins my group. We get in the car. What do we do? We just say, Lord, where do you want us to go? We start to pray. It was myself, a college girl from Virginia, and another guy named Davion, who we had met on the streets uh, earlier in the week also. Two of the people on my outreach team that night were just people we met on the streets that very week, okay? You don't need to sit in the church for 50 years to share the gospel. You just have to actually be available and actually go and do it, okay? There are people in your life right now, in the cubicle next to you at work, in the grocery store that you'll go to later today, who need you to be available for what the Spirit wants to do through you. So, so we get in the car, we pray. Uh, Lord, where would you have us go? And so this is the, this is the fun part. I didn't tell my wife at the, about this until later. I turned to uh, Colin, and I thought, Colin, man, you're from this area. You've had an interesting life here. Why don't you tell us where we should go? <laughs> I thought, hey, this buddy's got, he's got some good spots, right? We should, uh, he's going to send us somewhere good. He said, uh, yeah, I feel like when we're praying, I feel like we're supposed to go to the daiquiri shop. And I was like, okay. Look, here's how sheltered I am. I don't even know what a daiquiri is, okay? I'm totally serious. I, we show up, okay? I'm just going to, let me paint the context for you because it was just so much fun. 
uh, myself and this girl from Virginia are the only Caucasian people in the whole thing, right? There are dozens of people. It is awesome. It's the coolest place. Uh, did you know that daiquiris are like, like alcoholic speedway slushies? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even know this, right? That's pretty cool. So, uh, <laughs> so we go up. You know, our protocol is if we go to this place, we're never going to just barge in there, right? We want to. We always would ask permission before we ask to pray with someone. And so we go up to the counter, and uh, we meet this this young man named Tevin. His parents actually own the daiquiri shop. He's managing it that night, and we say, Tevin, we're you know this is kind of odd, but we're here, and we just want to offer to pray with folks, but actually, we just like to pray for you. Is there anything that, that you need prayer for? He said, uh, well, actually, it's crazy that you showed up today. Uh, I got myself into some trouble. I've got a court case later this week, and I really don't know what's going to happen. And I really could use prayer. For the next hour, we stood at the, the counter of the daiquiri shop. We prayed for Tevin, and we got to share about Jesus. Now listen to this. Guess who got to share their testimony about how they'd been set free from a life of crime because of Jesus? Yeah, Colin, who I met at the park the day before. After an hour of uh, of standing there and talking and praying, Tevin committed his life to Jesus. And then we got to match him up with a local believer from a church in his neighborhood so that he could disciple him. Do you see, like, these are not things you can scheme your way into. This only comes when you surrender yourself to the holy fire. Fire always spreads. But not if you keep yourself all cooped up. One last point. I know we're a little bit late. Are you okay for just a couple more minutes and I'll wrap it up? Okay. We'll we'll have you out here by 3 o'clock, I promise. Okay. Uh, Last point. This is the last point. Fire spreads, but also fire purifies. If we're going to see the Wesleyan stream revived, and honestly, more broadly than that, just the church in general, I think we have to reclaim the message of holiness. I believe if we do not reclaim the message of holiness, we've missed completely what it once meant to be a Methodist, and more basically, we've missed the good news of the gospel. Listen to this. If the Christian message is one that does not offer hope of being free from sin, then Jesus is a liar and the Bible is false advertising. I love the imagery at, in the end of Hebrews chapter 12 is one of my favorite books uh, or chapters in the whole Bible. Okay, There's so many things in here. The beginning of it's my kind of my life verse that I just try to live into. But the end of Hebrews 12 has this rich, just, oh, this is so good. I, w- I want to read it to you and then uh, just kind of just share a couple thoughts with, and, then we'll, and then we'll go. Hebrews chapter 12, listen, start at verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded, and even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Okay, let me just explain this is a, he's con, uh, the writer of Hebrews contrasting two mountains, uh, Mount Sinai, right, Mount Horeb, where where the Ten Commandments were received. This is this is pointing back uh, uh, to a place in Deuteronomy four, and then back uh, even beyond that, back into Exodus, where where the people who come to receive this sort of covenant, this commandments from God, they're given very specific instructions. They're not even allowed to come within a certain framework. They have to abstain from sexual relations. They have to to do ceremonial cleanings. There are so many restrictions in place because why? It says, if they come too close, they will be consumed. They'll be consumed with God's holiness. They cannot stand in His presence. And they will perish, you see. So 
So the writer of Hebrews says, you have not come to a mountain like that. No, listen, verse 22. But you have, now he's speaking to Christians, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God and judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See, that's why we can come to this mountain. Because why? Because of the blood of Jesus. Listen to this, verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. Who? The blood of Jesus. Because if you refuse the blood of Jesus, you will be consumed in the fires of God's holiness. If they did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Listen here. Verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. See, there's a big contrast that's drawn here. Do you see? In, in, in the Exodus story and, and, and in Deuteronomy, the retelling of that in, in Deuteronomy 4, that's where this quote, consuming fire, comes from. There's this warning to the people, don't get too close because you will get burned. Our God is a consuming fire. But the writer of Hebrews, you see, that he says it's full of joy. Because he says, no, 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 you don't come to Mount Sinai. You come to Mount Zion. You don't, you don't, you don't come trembling you know, be, because you can't get too close. You come with joy to surrender all that you have. Our God is a, a consuming fire. Do you see, here's the principle. God's holiness always burns away that which would defile it. You see, anything that comes into contact with God's holiness will be burned away if it is not pure. This is, a, this is what we see uh, you know, in, in the sacrificial system. Why do they offer a sacrifice? That the sacrifice might be consumed with fire and not the person bringing it, right? Here's where it gets good, okay? You ready for this? Listen again to the end of this, this passage. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and what? And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. What is our acceptable act of worship? Paul tells us. How do we do what Hebrews says? How do we now that we understand where we are coming and how we are coming, how do we, let it, how do we come thankfully to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe? How do we do that? What is our acceptable act of worship? See, Paul tells us. What does he say? Romans chapter 12. Because of Jesus, because his blood becomes our righteousness, we can stand in the fires of God's holiness and not be consumed any longer. That's why Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You see, as Christians, we, we, no longer, we no longer run in fear from our holy God. We don't, we don't fear the consuming fire. We hand ourselves over to it. Now, 
We willingly step into God's consuming fire, knowing that we are a living sacrifice. And a living sacrifice will not be put to death by the fire, only refined. The consuming fire kind of God becomes a refining fire when covered by the blood of Jesus. We do not fear the consuming fire. We yield ourselves to it. We thank God for it. We crawl up on the altar and ask God for more of it. This is our spiritual act of worship. To offer him all that we are. Our God is a consuming fire. And so bring more fire into our lives, O oh God. Praise the Lord that he is refining a bride for himself. That when he comes back one day, we'll be spotless and pure. You see, holiness, holiness is not a burden. It's a gift. If being called to holiness means being conformed into the likeness of Jesus, then there is no better life that we could live. It, tr it truly is your best life now. As one, <laughs> one famous writer, uh, popular, maybe not famous, would like to say. But it has nothing to do with your bank account or the car that you drive. All about being a living sacrifice conformed to the image of Jesus. And so here's my closing questions, and this is just going to, we'll just... We'll end with a song and send you out. Will you be set ablaze with boldness to actually to be holy fire that spreads, to utter the name of Jesus to your co-workers, to your friends? And God bless them to the very people that sit in your pew. Will you let God burn away the impurity that you might be holy and a witness to God's transforming power, will you leave this place and crawl upon the altar of God's grace and ask for more of fire from heaven that you might be set ablaze? Holy fire spreads and holy fire always purifies. And we need more fire. Our church needs the flame again. You know, um, when you're building a fire, you know, this is kind of basic. You know that you can stack the wood any way that you want to, but until you introduce the flame, it ain't going to do much. <laughs> you know what we do in our church a lot? We do a lot of rearranging firewood. But somebody's got to light a match. And I'm praying that even this weekend might be one match that God could drop in our midst. Would you stand? We're, I want to sing together. Let's sing a song. And then I'll just, I just want to pray a prayer of commissioning over you as we go that God would just set us ablaze for his glory.